Good morning. If I can bring you back to reality here. Uh, <laughs> we are uh, in the middle of a study, and uh, it is so drawn out, uh, you may not be able to connect, uh, you know, the studies uh, that we've had before. But uh, we're getting close to Christmas now. Uh, next week is Thanksgiving, and then uh, right away we're really into Christmas big time. And uh, we'll all be thinking about uh, the little town of Bethlehem. And we've been in a study I call O Bethlehem. And we're just looking at the biblical record of what is said concerning this little town and why Christ was born there. And so that's been our study. Um, there's much more in the Bible about Bethlehem than the Christmas story. In our first study, we went to the book of Ruth, a major story in the Bible about Bethlehem. And the uh, fields of Bethlehem where God provided for them. It's, uh, Bethlehem, is, uh, the name is uh, uh, translated house of bread. So he who is the bread of life was born in the house of bread. And uh, then we were looking at the kinsman redeemer, Boaz. And uh, Boaz is the only legitimate type in the Bible of the kinsman redeemer. He had the right to redeem. He was a true kinsman. He had the ability to redeem. He was a wealthy man. And he had the willingness to redeem. He was willing to marry uh, Ruth, the Moabite. And so uh, Christ is our kinsman redeemer. And so that, that translates back you know, into what Christ, uh, the whole book of Ruth, and the preparation of our understanding for the coming of Christ. And then last time we looked at the life of David. He was born in Bethlehem. He was crowned king in Bethlehem. Uh, it's a great picture of Christ, uh, you know, the shepherd king. Jesus is our shepherd king. That's why there were two visitors to Jesus uh, when he was born. There were shepherds in Luke 2, and there were kings in Matthew 2. That's why, because he's a shepherd and he's a king. And so we were looking at uh, that uh, last time. Now today we go to the other place in the Old Testament where Bethlehem is mentioned. It's a key text. It's in Math, uh, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. We're going to look at the wonderful prophecy of uh, the book of Micah, Micah 5, 2. And that says, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata. Maybe I should wait until you're able to find it. Uh, it's right after Jonah, if you can find that. And uh, so Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. That's a key prophetic text with regard to Bethlehem. Uh, another important verse in the Bible of the significance of Bethlehem as the birthplace of Christ. You know, uh, Christmas is a wonderful time of year, and we're already ramping up for it. I see that in a lot of places, you know, that it's already coming. The holiday celebrations, the exchange of gifts, you know, family gatherings and uh, festive dinners and special services and highlighting the birth of our Savior. It's always a great and beautiful time of the year. In fact, I personally really love the Christmas season because of all the emphases on Christ. But one part of Christmas uh, I find slightly disturbing. Uh, the crazy phenomena we call Christmas shopping. Shopping centers are called malls for a reason. <laughs> very likely you'll be mauled before you're done. Uh, a, man, a man was in a store and uh, he was, uh, had a screaming kid uh, with him. And he was really trying you know, to keep the kid going and he, he kept saying, well, keep calm, George, and don't panic, George, and don't yell, George. And a lady uh, commended the man that he was having uh, such a uh, attempts to quiet little George. And the man turned to the lady and said, Lady, I'm George. <laughs> <laughs> you know, living in Orlando, we're surrounded by malls. West Oak Mall, the Florida Mall, 
uh, Fashion Square Mall, uh, the uh, uh, Millennial Mall. We've got malls all around us. And we're acutely aware of congestion and traffic and crowds and all of that at Christmas season. It starts with a dull roar just before Thanksgiving here and, and it rises to an overwhelming crescendo of, fran of a frantic last minute shoppers right before Christmas. And it seems like our city beautiful has transformed into a feverish gang war of cars and people. It is truly a wild and crazy scene. I begin this way because that's not altogether unlike the little town of Bethlehem when Jesus was born there. On that first Christmas, people flooded the streets and shops of Bethlehem from all over uh, the Middle East. And the reason was that the Roman Caesar Augustus had put out a edict that there had to be a taxation of the Roman Empire and uh, the registry of all the people for the purpose of that taxation and it was Herod who suggested that for the Jews that the place of their ancestry was the best place to be registered. So that's how he was trying to placate the Jews by taking them back to their place of registry. And Mary and Joseph lived north of Galilee, uh, in Galilee, and uh, they were of the tribe of David, uh, which was really the tribe of Judah. And they had to travel about 70 miles, maybe a little more, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Uh, then five miles further south, uh, after they got to Jerusalem, through the rugged hilly terrain, about 2,550 feet above sea level, uh, to the little town of Bethlehem, set on a limestone ridge over the Judean highland. Uh, all under great hardship. Mary had come to term in her pregnancy. Uh, it was an arduous journey, journey for her. And like hundreds of others, uh, they were coming to Bethlehem from all over the empire. Everyone who traced their roots to David had to go to Bethlehem. The little town swelled to overflowing. It was just amazing what the town had to endure. The inn was full, crowds were jostling through the streets, every conceivable spot of hospitality was occupied. Merchants, I'm sure, were excited and it was great fun for them to have all these people in the town. And uh, people were seeing relatives for the first time in years, so it was a real festive time for a lot of folk being there in Bethlehem. Yet the great majority uh, you can almost say everyone, except for a few, were totally unaware of the spiritual magnitude of that day. Uh, there was a little community in Kentucky called Hodgenville, and uh, a man was returning from Elizabethtown, which was a larger city some ways away, and his neighbor was asking him what was happening in the outside world that he had learned in Elizabethtown. And the morning, uh, man said, well, there have been wars in Europe and there are uh, things going on in uh, the capital, you know, and, uh, and then he asked the man, he says, well, what happened here in Hodgenville while I was away? And uh, the neighbor said, oh, nothing. Oh, I believe Mrs. Lincoln did give birth to a baby boy last night. They named him Abraham. <laughs> but nothing important ever happens here. And that's a lot like Bethlehem. And the people were totally oblivious to what was happening, completely unaware that God had come to earth, right there in their midst. Large crowds were totally indifferent to the baby born among the animals in the stable and laid in a humble straw-covered manger. Now, for merchants, business as usual uh, had become business as unusual with the uh, bazaars and everything going ringing with the noise of commerce. And how picturesque of our generation in its celebration of Christmas. We sing, O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It was not a still little town. Uh, it was disturbed little town, filled with hassled people, an overwhelming, crowded little village. 
But in the midst of it all, something very significant was happening. The most momentous event in the history of the world that would ever take place in the world was happening right there in their midst. God had purposed to be born as a baby that he might become the redeemer of lost men as foretold by the prophet Micah 600 years before. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the sons of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from uh, of old, from everlasting. So that's our study this morning. Um, I want you to notice the prophecy. Uh, it begins with Matthew 2, with the wise men coming all the way to Jerusalem, asking Herod where the, where the, uh, the king of the Jews had been born. He was totally oblivious. He had no idea. So he called everybody to get the chief priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everybody that, you know, that could, he could uh, bring. And he says, hey, find out where this little guy is going to be born. He was immediately jealous and uh, he was very disturbed, uh, it says in Matthew 2. And when Herod was disturbed, so was everybody else. And uh, so uh, the scribes and uh, the ruler Herod and the wise men, they all understood the significance of this prophecy because the scribes said, hey, here's where the ruler is going to be born. It's going to be in Bethlehem. That's what Micah 5.2 says. And he quotes Micah 5.2 in Matthew 2. That is such a significant prophecy concerning the coming of Christ. A study of Bethlehem has to include this prophecy. So we've been in historical records in uh, in uh, Ruth and in the study of David, but now uh, it's the prophetic record, one verse in Micah. I have three observations for you. Letter A, if you have the outline in front of you, okay. Letter A, the story of Bethlehem. The place was called Bethlehem Ephrathah. What in the world is Ephrathah? Uh, Names are significant in the Bible, usually reflect something of the history of the person or the town. In uh, Genesis uh, chapter 35 and verse 19, when Rachel had died there, and uh, it says, so Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrathah. The A-H on the end is a feminine ending, usually used of towns and, uh, and uh, districts. And she was born on the way to Ephrath, or Ephrathah. Today, the traditional site of Rachel's tomb is an imposing structure. As the road turns to Bethlehem off the main road, right there is where the tomb of uh, Rachel is. And Ephrathah, or Ephrathah, was the earlier foundational name. It was always associated with the town. It's always Bethlehem Ephrathah. Bethlehem is the town, Ephrathah is the district. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 11, at the end of the book of Ruth, when the genealogy, or, uh, gene genealogy is given and the peoples were blessing uh, Ruth for the birth of her son, it says, and, many, and may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. That's what they were saying to her. May you become famous in Ephrathah. In 1 Samuel 17, 12, with David, as he was uh, going to be anointed as king. And David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse. You'll read those two names put together a lot. Bethlehem, Ephrathah. So what is this word, Ephrathah? It means fertile field or fruitful one. That's very similar to Bethlehem, which is house of bread or fruitfulness. And uh, the Anchor Bible Dictionary uh, gives what they consider to be a reason for this word Ephrathah. Uh, it's not very accurate, I don't think. They say that in the second millennium BC, a clan of Ephraim settled in Bethlehem. And that's the evidence. Uh, it's a linguistic evidence, not historical at all. But uh, Ephrathi, Jesus, uh, or Jesse, and Ephrathi, that's uh, going to be um, a tribe of Ephraim. 
but there's no historical record of that, no evidence that if, uh, you know, Ephraim ever came down into that area. The better, uh, uh, you know, uh, derivation of this is the genealogical record, a more plausible derivation. In 1 Chronicles chapter 2, this is a significant passage, 1 Chronicles 2, 18 to 20. And this is the genealogy of Caleb, who was a son or really a, a, a descendant of Judah. And in 1 Chronicles 2, 18, it says, And Caleb, the son of Hezron, begot children of Azubah, his wife, and of Jerioth. Her sons are these, Jeshur and Shobab and Ardan. And when Azubah has, was dead, so his wife died, he took unto him another wife whose name was Ephrath, E-P-H-R-A-T-H, -E who bore him her, her begot Uri, and Uri begot Bezalel. And uh, uh, so uh, it's uh, the family of Caleb where this word, his wife was Ephrath. Um, in Joshua 14, when uh, the tribes are being dispersed, uh, where they're going to have their settlements, and Joshua's uh, dealing it all out. In Joshua 14, verses 6 to, and following, it says, And the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephuneth, the Kenizzite, said unto him, uh, you know the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old I was when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again, and it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon your feet have trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. So he's for, or, or, uh, forty-five years later. Since then the Lord spoke this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. He was eighty-five years old. He had two years on me, uh, you know, 83 almost. And so uh, that's pretty old. I know, I can tell you, it's pretty old. <laughs> and uh, so then he goes on and says, and uh, yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me in my strength. Even so my strength now for war, both to go in and come out. I can't say that, I, you know, I'm not as strong now as I was when I was 40. So, you know, now therefore give me this mountain, he says, of which the Lord spoke in that day that you, that you heard in the day that the Anakim were there, and these are the giants, and uh, that uh, caused the others to say, no, we can't take this land. And the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. If, it's, if, if so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So what the, the, the ten tribe guys who went in with them said they couldn't do. Caleb says, I'll do it with my family. So this is a pretty, you know, he's a pretty incredible guy. And so uh, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephun, uh, Jephuneth, uh, the Kenizzite, unto this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Karabartha, and Arabah was the great a man among the Anakim, and the land was rest, had rest from war. So Caleb was given the very area where they had gone in. And this was in the south of Israel, down south of Bethlehem. It's in the area of Hebron, which is where he said, I'm going to take this town. So we go back to uh, First Chronicles chapter 2 again. And uh, I want you to re uh, hear the uh, uh, offspring of uh, Caleb this guy who's going to do all of this. There was, or sons of Caleb, the son of Hur, was the firstborn. So the firstborn of Caleb. And Ephrathah, that was his wife, his new wife after his first wife died. Their son was Hur, H-U-R. And then uh, Hur had uh, three sons, Shobal and Salma and Haref. 
They were all the sons of Caleb and Ephrath. And Salma had a son. His name was Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem was the great grandson of Caleb, who was born to Ephrath, or Ephratha. Uh, she was the matriarch of the territory that Caleb had, that whole area down by Hebron, south of Bethlehem. And he was the great grandson of Caleb. He was born to his great grandmother, Ephrath. Therefore, the name of the area was Ephrath. That was the territory after the matriarch, Caleb's wife. The town was named, therefore, this little area of Ephrath, was named Bethlehem after the great grandson of Caleb. And uh, he was the one who founded the little town called by his name. Bethlehem. So it's named after a descendant of Caleb. So that genealogy really spells it out. It tells us exactly what happened here. Uh, Bethlehem was the father of the little town that bore his name. Uh, correspondence between the fertility of the land, Ephrathah, and the production of grain in Bethlehem. Thereafter, it was known as Bethlehem, the little town in the area of Ephrathah. So, the fertile fields had, been, had given rise to the house of bread, which in turn was the birthplace of him who was the bread of life. And that is the story of Bethlehem in the district of Ephrathah. You understand the word Ephrathah? It's always with Bethlehem, and you wonder, may wonder why, what's that? And this helps us understand that. That's the story of Bethlehem. Now, letter B, the stature of Bethlehem according to the prophecy of Micah in Micah 5.2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the sons of Judah. It was little. This is a Hebrew word, sa'ir. Uh, it means small, little, insignificant. It make, means weak. It means humble. Uh, when Samuel came to Jesse's house in Bethlehem to anoint the king, the six sons came before Jesse, and none of them were it. And Samuel said, don't you have another son? Oh, yeah, the kid that's out in the field. He was too little to be counted among the sons of uh, Jesse. And Bethlehem, too, was too little to be considered. Uh, small with regard to being among the Elephim, thousands of Judah. Uh, the point is, an Eleph is a thousand. Elephim is the plural there. Eleph. Families, heads of families of a thousand. A clan. It's an estimate, not an exact number. Bethlehem was too small to form an independent Eleph. They didn't have a thousand people. Uh, it didn't measure up to an Eleph. Never mentioned in the list of Judah's cities. In Joshua 15 and Nehemiah 11, where the cities of Judah are mentioned, Bethlehem is never mentioned. It's too little uh, to be mentioned. So, uh, it's a little town. When I was a young boy, I wanted to play ball with the big kids. And uh, they would say to me, you're too little. You're too small. I wanted to be counted with the big kids, but I was not accepted because I wasn't big enough. And that's the way Bethlehem was. In John 7, this is the Feast of uh, Tabernacles, and Jesus is there, and there are uh, those around that are arguing about the Messiah and where he's going to come from. And uh, it says, Hath not the Scripture said, this is the uh, ones that are looking for, the uh, birthplace of the Messiah. Hath not the scripture said that the Christ comes of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? It's now called, it's called a town in that, uh, at that time. That's the Greek word, kome. It's a village, a hamlet, a small town. Uh, years ago, I, uh, I read a thing that caught my attention. It was kind of funny, and so I cut it out. It was a Newsweek article. It was in 1979. That tells you how long ago it was. But it was a story about the comedian Steve Martin. You ever know Steve Martin? And he called Terre Haute, Indiana the most nowhere place in the world. 
And uh, sometime later, he was uh, asked to come back and do some performing there in Terre Haute, and they had some fun at his expense. He visited Terre Haute, and uh, the sign was there welcoming Dean Martin. <laughs> uh, the mayor presented him with a bouquet of wilted flowers. <laughs> he was given a beat up 57 Chevy to use with a broken door on the driver's side. <laughs> uh, he was given a tour of Smithy's Jiffy car wash and a fertilizer plant. <laughs> He was given a $20 gift certificate for a farm tool, and he was taken to dinner at a local diner. And Steve Martin was quoted as saying, excuse me. <laughs> he had called it the most nowhere place in the world. That's like Bethlehem. The most nowhere place in the world. Bethlehem was known because of the birth of Jesus Christ, and back then it really wasn't much of a place back then, but it's become more now. And God chose the most nowhere place in the world for his personal step into the earth. That's significant. The most nowhere place in the world. God purposely rejected man's greatness and chose man's littleness, too little to be among the clans of Judah. You know, the only way God will ever come to us is in our littleness. And the bigger we are in our own minds, the more we cancel out the fellowship of God. We even get to the point where we think we don't need God at certain times and uh, he's not really invited. But it's when we're down, not so big, when we're little, when we're much more open to the presence of the Lord. We want greatness and God gives us humility. We want uh, nice things and he gives us a humble animal shelter. Uh, we want uh, pleasant things, and he gives us a straw-covered manger. We want ambition, and he gives us the little town of Bethlehem. Is it any wonder that the world doesn't want Jesus? He's not great enough. He's not big enough. He's born in Bethlehem. His kingdom is not of this world, and they are not impressed. He purposely chooses our littleness to make known his greatness. There's actually a verse in the New Testament that says that in 1 uh, first, uh, first Corinthians 2 and verse 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So when will we ever learn uh, that if it's only when we humble ourselves that God is pleased to use us? The stature of Bethlehem tells us something of what God chooses when he blesses. Too little to be among the clans of Judah. And let us see our last point here. The strength of Bethlehem. The last part of uh, Micah 5. Uh, Out of you will come for me the ruler whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Two things here. Number one, Jesus Christ is the ultimate ruler. He's the ruler God has chosen, the ruler God has brought to the world at Bethlehem. From Bethlehem, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Now, David was God's ruler in Israel. Was, he was born and anointed in Bethlehem. But when Micah the prophet wrote this, David was long gone. Uh, this is not a reference to David. This is a prophecy in Micah that is futuristic. The prophecy uh, is a messianic prophecy and understood that way. The Jews understood it that way. In Matthew 2, 5 to 6, the scribes went to Micah to find out where the king was born. They went Micah 5, 2 the prophecy of the coming Messiah. In John, 40, uh, John 7, 42, the Jews were arguing uh, about Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. And they said, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? 
they knew it. They knew it really well, but they didn't know the history of Jesus. They didn't know he was born in Bethlehem. And they were assuming he was a, just a Galilean out of Nazareth. So the point was common knowledge. The ultimate ruler of the world, God's anointed one, the Messiah, who would rule the wor world, rule the earth, would be born in Bethlehem. The Bible presents Jesus as that ruler. In Matthew 2 and verse 1, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, is what it says. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And then you have the angelic announcement. In Luke 1, verses 8 to 16, it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were very much afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And then in verse 15 it says, And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. Now they were out in the fields. So we're going to go into town. Let's go unto Bethlehem and see the thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste. They didn't lag at all. They were almost running. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Uh, that's what Luke 1, 8 to 16 says. When Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, Bethlehem saw the fulfillment of Micah 5 and verse 2. He is the ultimate ruler. Second, Jesus Christ is the eternal God. His goings forth are from of old, from the days of eternity. That's how it ends in Micah 5. The word eternity is olam, and that is the word that's translated eternal or eternity uh, all the way through the scriptures. I became really disappointed in the ESV here. I've used the ESV a lot and I tend to like a lot of what it says and does. But I think they got carried away with the first phrase is goings forth are from long ago. And they translated it from ancient days instead of from everlasting. RSV from RSV, yeah. And the reason the uh, Revised Standard Version, the uh, ESV, was based on the RSV. It says that at the beginning of any ESV translation you have, and that's where they got it, from the ESV. Uh, they got it from the RSV. Uh, from ancient days, they totally missed the point. There are no days, no ancient days. He's from of old, but not from ancient days of old. He is from of old everlasting. That's the word that's used. It's translated everywhere else as everlasting. And the ESV didn't do that. And I was disappointed in them when I read that. Uh, the ultimate ruler of the world who would be born in Bethlehem would be very God himself. Out of the littleness of man would emerge the strength of God. It means Christ had no beginning. Make no mistake about it, the one born in Bethlehem who would be the ruler of the universe is God. His going forth have been from of old, that is, from olam, eternity. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. That's what Micah actually says. So, in conclusion, as we've looked at this prophecy of Micah, you know, we've all sung the Christmas carol, O little town of Bethlehem, and uh, I want to just uh, quote to you verse 4 of O little town of Bethlehem. It's an invitation to participate with Christ. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. 
That is the invitation of the, uh, the Christmas hymn, O, uh, o Little Town of Bethlehem. So the invitation is really about us. It's about you. And they understood that when they did the uh, poetry for that uh, song. Uh, descend to us, be born in us. And that's the invitation that we have it here. I mean, do you really know Jesus Christ? Do you realize that he is God? Do you realize that he was born in the most nowhere place in the world? And uh, he was born in a town that uh, uh, was considered so little they wouldn't even count it. And you, can't, you think, well, how can he be God? God does amazing things. He's always choosing, you know, the uh, side of submission and the side of, of, uh, of uh, littleness. Even in his death when he was taken to Calvary, you know, he set his face to go to Calvary and he went there and they took him and they crucified him. And, uh, and, they, and Satan and the demons probably had a, you know, a howling time, you know, thinking, wow, we've killed him. All right, we're done with him. We're done with this guy. And Jesus, with total humility, with the sacrifice of himself, defeated Satan. I tell you what, I mean, that was uh, an amazing con game. You know, Jesus conned him out. You know, he thought he was winning and he lost. Because Jesus knows where the power is. It's in littleness, it's in humbleness, it's in smallness. And that's what he wants us to understand. Not to aspire to anything big, not to think that we're gonna be somebody great, but just simply to be humble in Christ and to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus with anyone who will hear that uh, Jesus Christ is the God of heaven, come as a baby in Bethlehem, to grow to be the man who died for our sins. There were three responses. Herod knew this verse. He was told by the scribes, but he was outraged against it. And that leads us into our next study. The scribes knew it. They're the ones that found it. They knew exactly where to go to Micah 5 and verse 2. But they were indifferent to it. The wise men knew it because they were told and they worshiped Jesus. So the Lord's looking for wise men, not rulers and scribes. That's the third study of O Bethlehem, the prophecy of Micah chapter five and verse two. Let's have prayer. Father, we're humbled as we read the scriptures and realize that you are the essence of humbleness. That the way you came into the world in Bethlehem was so outrageous, it fooled even the demons of hell. Uh, that he was such a humble person, a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. Nobody in the town except the shepherds knew at the time that uh, you had come in the form of a baby and uh, would grow to man and be the savior of the world. And uh, we're just really astounded by the story and by the prophecy of Micah. A little town, too little to be counted. And that's where Jesus had his start in this world. So Lord, I pray you'd help us to see the need for humility, and the acceptance of smallness and littleness and to be able to reach out to people and say, you know, the Lord Jesus is really the God of heaven and you need to know him because he is the one who can save you from your sins. Bless us in that, Father. Give us an, 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 uh, a desire to share the Lord Jesus in all of the little times of life not thinking of the big times, but the little times where a single person may need to know about Jesus. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.